It's a new day, and we're trying to get to people with the Word of God in some way. And last night we had our prayer meeting, which is something that's attended um, a little smaller group. It's a little smaller group. So just wanted to check and see how this is going to work. And with that said, I just want to tell you some of the things we talked about last night. We were in the book of Habakkuk, and we were in Habakkuk in chapter 3. The Bible says it was a prayer of Habakkuk, uh, the prophet, upon Shigianoth. And that Shigianoth literally has the idea of being something that is, is uh, abhorrent, an ab aberration. And the aberration that uh, Habakkuk had in mind was that he had heard that the Assyrians were come. He's a prophet where they were coming. He's a prophet. And so he begins to ponder this and work through this in the first chapter and the second chapter and subsequently what he does is he comes to a place in the third chapter and prays over what he's accepted as true but his prayer is a prayer that does say in fact that he is going to uh, be very very much um, trying to remind God of exactly what is going to what it, God's history is and so he starts this this song, really, it's a prayer, but they take their prayers, they turn them into songs. And so this is a song, and he, uh, he speaks to God, and he says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now in verse 2, he says, I have heard thy speech. That literally means he has heard the report. Chapter 1, he heard the report. The Assyrians are coming. I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Of course he's afraid because it's coming to his people. It's not a good thing uh, to look forward to and to know is coming. And subsequently he says, In the midst of the years, revive thy work. In the midst of the years, he says, In the midst of the years, make known your work. What is his work? His work has always been to cherish the people of, of, um, of Israel. He's delivered them from Egyptian bondage. He's given them conquests. He's helped them come through the, the Red Sea. Miracles. And what he does in these first two verses is he gives a concern that is his from what he knows is coming. And subsequently he gets into verses 3 and following and he starts laying out a catalog of God's work. Now what we need to remember in our time is that though this is a dark day, it is a time where God's work is still really right on track. God is going to use the things that are going on in this world right now, and he's going to turn them for his glory. God is bringing America down to some degree. We're going to be buckling at the knees. The economy is probably going to be hammered. The coronavirus is probably way overblown in the things that it said. And, and if it's not, then we're going to have a a hit with the, the economy and the virus. So however it unfolds, uh, we have to understand that God is the one who's in the, in the background of everything. People say, well, how could God do that? Well, let me say, the question really is begged not how could God do this, but why hasn't God done it earlier? I mean, we have been provoking God for a very long time with abortion, uh, with homosexual rights and marriage and, 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 and the attack on the sanctity of marriage. Uh, everything that is right and good has been vilified. It is Isaiah where the Bible says, Woe unto a people who call good evil and evil good. So this is what is coming to Israel in chapter 3. And subsequently, we have a man named uh, Habakkuk who is singing this song out to God in probably mournful tones, but energetic, because the way it unfolds is he begins to remind God of Teman, and uh, in verse 3, he, God came from Teman, and he came from Paran, and, and he's saying, this is the God who comes from the south, okay, because they're in the northern kingdom that's going to fall by the Assyrians. He says, this is the God who comes from the south, meaning that he is the God who is seated down in the uh, city of Jerusalem, down in the most holy place of the temple. He's the God who came into this land with the, with the conquest of, of Joshua. He came into the land with the uh, movements of God's miraculous things, like, like the falling of the walls of Jericho, all those things. He's going to catalog that, but he says, God, 
Uh, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glorious or his glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Now he's he he used the little connective Selah in the midst here because what he does is he's showing us that God did something amazing in the beginning uh, with Israel, but even before that, his work was that he created the earth, and it was a praise to him. Uh, the Bible says in verse 3, it says, His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Everything praised the Lord until the fateful day of the fall. Uh, the Bible says in verse 4 that his brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hands. And those horns are really flashes of light. Many believe it was like lightning in his hands. And that happened when the flood came. It had never rained before then. And I'm kind of walking you through this quickly, what we talked about for at late yesterday. Well, we also see that his, 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 this, this flashing of light in his hands, uh, it, the Bible says that there was the hiding of his power. Now, you've got to understand, God can do anything. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And so when you're looking at this passage, you see that God does abide in the lightness, in the light. He is, he is, he is clothes himself uh, with light, and you, you, you can't see him. And the Bible even talks about un, unapproachable light. The Bible talks about Jesus when he was seen in the book of Revelation, his face shone like the sun in its strength. The Bible says in the transfiguration, you couldn't look at it without, uh, without shuddering. And so, subsequently, we see him moving in this catalog to God's uh, creative power. Now we're seeing his, his, his correcting power, because at the flood, it was a bad day for everybody on earth except for eight souls in the ark. The Bible says, before him went pestilence. This is what God does. He brings pestilence and burning coals, and the and, and Bible says, and burning coals went forth at his feet. So what we're seeing there is we're seeing that he, is, he has power, uh, it is in Amos, the Bible says, Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord had not brought it? That is a good question. Most people think that any kind of evil God would never do. No, God is a good God. God is a just God. And God does evil, uh, brings evil, or we could say calamity, into a city to attention. What we're seeing right now is God getting the world's attention. And when, we're, uh, when we are looking at the news reports and we're seeing things that maybe sometimes don't add up as far as the numbers and, and what they're saying uh, on the news reports and, and the cases, and they're really not giving us the logistics of it all, what we're seeing is, is that God is allowing the minds of those who are in authority to be darkened to some degree. And that's a judgment as well. The Bible says in verse 5, before went the pestilence. And that's what God does. He'll bring pestilence in a land to get everybody's attention, bring them back to, a, to, to, a, to heal, if you will, to bring them back to the Lord. Verse 6, it says, He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the, the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered, and the perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. That is a re, re, repeat of what he said earlier when he Remember or revive your work. Uh, remember mercy in judgment. And he says, God's ways are everlasting. Because even though there was a flood, there was an ark. And many could have gotten on and chose not to. And even though the flood came, God then moved the mountains. He moved the, 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 the topography of the earth. And subsequently what happened is God showed his power all over again. As the waters assuaged, uh, and, the, and the ark landed into the mountains of Ararat as time went on, there was a very deliberate um, uh, movement of God in the midst of the people uh, that were left on that ark. They could see how he had, had spared them. And the whole earth then was retooled. And then we get the table of nations in Genesis 10, which he says the nations are kind of broken up in a certain way. Verse 7 says, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was God displeased with the rivers? Was he, uh, was he angry against the rivers? Uh, no, he was, uh, it was thy wrath of, against the sea, it says. So you have rivers, rivers, but it's talking about Cushan, talking about Midian. 
Now, the context of that is Midian was where Jethro lived when Moses left Egypt, fearing for his life. He married a Midianitish woman. His father was a priest of Midian. So we're talking about down in the southern regions around, regions around Africa, northern Africa, around in Egypt. And the Bible says that the rivers, uh, he said, it says, were the rivers, was God mad at the rivers? No, when he parted the Red Sea, that water had to go somewhere. It was backed up. And it's an amazing picture of what the Bible says happened when God led his people out of the Egyptian bondage. Understand something. The Word of God is amazing. And he says, the tents of Kushan, uh, I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction, and the curtains of, of Midian did tremble. Uh, was the Lord displeased with the rivers, and, and thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, uh, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? God wasn't obviously angry. What Habakkuk is doing is he's reflecting. He says, God, you're amazing. You can even take this river, these rivers, and bring praise to your name. You can take the sea, and you can part it. It's amazing what it says on down. In verse, you made your bow quite naked. In other words, you unsheathed your sword. What for? For salvation, at the end of verse 8. I'm in Habakkuk 3, in verse 8. The Bible says, you made your, uh, or verse 9, you made your bow quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes. In other words, according to your word. You promised them that you would be with them, and when he delivered them from the Egyptian bondage, that's exactly what he did. So he made his bow quite naked then, and the word Selah is interjected again to say, think about that. You just think about that. This is what God can do. You did cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. Notice what that said. It says, you only took care of the mountains raising up and the water assuaging after the flood. But when you delivered the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, what also you did was you made the, uh, the Red Sea. Look at the end of verse 10 in chapter 3 of Habakkuk. It says, you made the, uh, the sea or the deep uh, lift up his hands on high. Amazing. As they pass through the middle, he's saying, remember your ways, O God. Now listen, we need to know this, because in knowing this, we know that no matter what happens as a child of God, God can get us through this too. If I were to go through all of this, which I'm not going to do right now, because this is really a test run, just trying to see whether I can actually do all this. I've never done this before on, uh, on Facebook. Don't know about this live streaming thing, so I'm getting my mind around it. But right now, what I want you to know is that God had a way in the past his ways are everlasting. He's already said that. His ways are everlasting, and God has a way through this. And he's working toward the salvation of souls. This world mocks the righteous, mocks the good, mocks the God of glory. It, mock, it mocks the people who are out there doing the good things for God's causes. Uh, I want to suggest to you, through this, you see at the end of verse 13, the word of Selah, and he moves into another thing, and he really, he references the, uh, the death of um, Naaman, not Naaman, but the death of this, the, 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 uh, Naaman, who, the death of the man who, the, the uh, Jael's nail, Sisera, I got it, uh, he, it, it references the song of Deborah in regard to the death of Sisera at the hands of a woman. She takes a stake and puts it through the head of the man who is trying to destroy God's people. Uh, when there's people afoot and trying to destroy, well, that, that's, that's a problem. And this world is all about diminishing the righteous and diminishing the good. So he says, remember your ways, God. Revive your work. Do a, rebel, uh, do a redemptive thing right now. And when it talks about, uh, in verse 14, about the striking through with his staves, the head, and it says... Uh, in verse 15, it says, You did walk through the sea upon thy, with thy horses, uh, through the deep of great waters. When I heard the things that you did, I, he says, those amaze me. But he says, but when I hear the things you're going to do, he says, hearkening back to verse 2, he says, I heard my belly trembled. He says, when I heard my lips quivered, at, or, my lips quivered at your voice. 
And he says, and rottenness entered in my bones. Now, know this. What happens right now when you're hearing the news, maybe you're feeling a little depressed, discouraged, unsettled. You know, that's what Habakkuk felt when he saw what was going on, going to be happening uh, out in, uh, in, 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 from Assyria coming and taking down his people. He, he says, I trembled in myself. This is all in verse 16. This is your verse. I trembled in myself. Uh, my rotten bones, I trembled, my lips quivered, my belly, it, it trembled. He says, I trembled. This happened to me. Why? That I might rest in the day of trouble. Right now, you're coming to tr grips with the fact that this world could be turned upside down. The economy could go hugely sideways. People uh, could be getting more and more sick over the next few months if what they say is true. I have questions about that. I'm not sure I buy into all of the narrative. But I do know this, if it does, it could be bad. But the Bible tells us that what he, God wants us to do is he wants us to rest, listen, rest in time of trouble or in the day of trouble. He says, when he cometh up unto the people, he made them with his troops. He says, I saw that, that narrative bothered me. It broke my heart, it destroyed me in my core. I, I just couldn't deal with it. He says, but it happened to me that I might rest in the day of trouble. There is a place of quiet rest near to the a place where fear cannot molest near to the heart of God. But we're so far from the heart of God that we allow ourselves to get caught up in the fear. So he goes on and he says, because I've gotten to the place now where I get it, you're going to do what you're going to do, God. And I'm okay with that. Just remember my prayer. My prayer is revive your work. My prayer is remember in judgment, remember mercy. And he says, I'm going to rest even when that comes. And he says, uh, now my conclusion, as I said, there was a concern that he prayed about. He mentions in verses 1 and 2 that he gives a catalog of things that God has done in the past, enumerating God's work. And in verse 11, uh, 17, he says this in regard to his conclusions, his personal conclusions. He says, although the fig tree does not blossom, that's not, may not, it's a shall not. He says, even though the fig tree will not blossom, neither shall there be fruit in the vine, and labor of the oil shall fail, and the fields shall not yield meat, and the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Even though that's going to happen, I see it, God. I see what you're doing. He says, even though that has happened, it's going to happen, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. And he's telling us this. I know God is, and he's going to make whatever happens here work together for his purposes, his glory. He will remember mercy and judgment and substance. Consequently, take this to heart, beloved. If you're out there, you're worried, just know this. If you're worried right now, God is stretching you so you can rest in the day of trouble because the day of trouble will certainly come. And the Bible teaches that very clearly. It doesn't mean that we're going through the tribulation. It just means before we get there, there's going to be a lot of birth pangs, and we're going to have to deal with some of that. And subsequently, when we look at this passage, we see that Habakkuk came to terms with it. And he was able to in the Lord and his mind went beyond this life and he says you will make me walk upon mine high places that reminds us of what God told Daniel he would be he would sleep and be raised again we remember Job and his misery what did he say he says I know that my Redeemer liveth and I shall see him in the latter day that even though the worms eat my flesh I will see him with mine own eyes of another. They knew about resurrection. They knew about eternity. They knew about God. And they knew that their relationship with that God would, 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 would guarantee, if you will, as Habakkuk is saying here, that he would make us, that he would make our feet like hinds feet and that he would um, make us to walk in our high places. So I hope you could take that and read that chapter and look over there and maybe uh, consult a few commentaries. You'll find some pretty neat things in his catalog. But right now, just for your sake, I want to pray that God will help all of us in this country 
to just calm down those of us who are believers. Remember, we need to get our game face on. People need the Lord, and we need to share him with them because they don't know him, and they're freaking out, and we just need to keep our heads uh, about us because this is a crazy time. I'm going to pray right now for our country and anybody who might listen to this message in the future. Father, I pray that you would help us, each one, to be at peace, trying to do this whole thing that I'm having, just retooling and figuring out how to reach out to people. It's, it's, it's difficult, Father, the, the upheaval, the land shifting under us. I just pray for any father who are nervous about the future, that they would remember that you're allowing them to be stretched a little bit right now so that they might rest in the day of trouble. And I pray, Father, that I would rest more. I pray you'd give me clarity that I might be a blessing to people when I have opportunity. And I pray that same prayer for each person who might hear this word that we've shared here today and brief. Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for looking in. Just, uh, this will be posted, I guess. That's how this works. I'm still learning, so.